Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 5, Episode 3, Looking for Parmok in All the Wrong Places. This episode aired October 14th, 1996. Before we talk about this one, anything to clear up about last week's episode, which was The Ship? No, it was perfect. That episode was serious business. This episode's not not so much. That's a good summary. Yeah. That episode dealt with some very serious issues of command, and I think this episode is written by a 14-year-old. <laughs> At least. Should we dig into this one? Let's go for it. In the cold open, Julian is snooping around outside of the O'Brien quarters, eavesdropping on a fight going on inside. Quark catches him and then proceeds to share what his big ears can hear when Keiko approaches and we realize it's Miles and Kira arguing, not Miles and Keiko. It seems Miles doesn't want Kira taking any risks as long as she's carrying his baby, and Kira doesn't want to be controlled. It all feels quite ridiculous as medical science seems pretty well evolved, and I think we could trust the science here, but... Maybe not. Well, Julian's been keeping an extremely close eye on her. He's been getting those spiders to help with symptoms. Yeah. All sorts of things. So if he's keeping this close an eye and Kira is not specifically told she shouldn't be doing these things because it puts her at risk, which the doctors would typically do. Yeah. I don't think it's really Miles's place to make any comment about what she should be able to do and not do. And this falls into, let's throw some good old-fashioned tropes out there to make Miles the ignorant working man. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, I agree that it doesn't make a ton of sense. Especially for a science guy. Miles (laughs) understands technology. Yeah. He's not some uneducated individual who's just making stuff up. But they do stuff like this all the time with him and just... I know. I, I guess just for a laugh. At the same time... Oh, because it's funny. I could see a really valid story being about the concerns of the parents, because this is something unusual. Yeah. The baby was taken out of their care and put into the care of someone else, essentially, and so now somebody else becomes the incubator. Right. And I could see them making it kind of serious and having some serious conversations about it, but no, instead it's this. (laughs) It's this sort of silly stuff. Yeah. You mean instead of doing a nuanced intelligent story about the risks involved you get out your bad soap opera tropes and you write an episode we so frequently fall back to that on this show maybe all of star trek does i I don't know but this show definitely does yeah i there's a variation in the writing that is quite remarkable yeah and it episodes like this really make it stand out right Yeah, I think I was five minutes into this episode and went, oh, yeah, it's this one. Oh, no. Well, anyway, then we go to Worf and Dax discussing Klingon opera. I think they're in the replomat. I didn't write it down, but I think that's where they were. And as they chat, one of the airlocks opens and in walks Grilka, the Klingon woman from the House of Quark in season three. And Worf is immediately struck by her, calling her glorious. (laughs) <laughs> he skulks around the bar watching her yeah. <laughs> with Dax sort of following behind. And he's really unhappy to see her grab Quark and hug him. Dax says, oh, that's Quark's ex-wife, which really horrifies Worf. Yeah. And then we cue the theme song. I'm surprised he wouldn't know about that. I would have thought that might have come up with Dax discussing Klingons and Klingons on the station. Or Quark saying something about it because he likes to brag. That's very true. And he loved to brag about the whole story of him killing a Klingon (laughs) in single combat. Exactly. I will say, I think things are looking up for the House of Grilka because she now has an additional henchman. Yeah, now she's got a bodyguard or something. Yeah, I mean, before it was just the old family retainer who's there. Right. We go back to the bar and Quark and Grilka are having a toast together. And Quark asks why she's dropped by, and she talks about the financial cost of the Federation-Klingon conflict to her family, and Quark figures out that he wants her to look at her financial records. (laughs) Yeah. Though they pretend that's not why she's there, because uh, Klingons aren't supposed to care about money and financial records because there's no honor in it or something. That happened in the the House of Quark episode. That was actually quite good, how she doesn't want to admit that she needs somebody to look at the finances. Right. 
and was like, well, if you desire to look at these things, I shall allow it. Yeah, I was like, oh, exactly. okay, that's pretty good. If it'll make you feel better, I'll let you do it. Yeah, I was like, Ni- nicely done. I could see a lot of that in Klingon society as a way of face saving. Yes, exactly. Did you think, Yeah. this is another thing I noticed that I think maybe their family is now on the up. She appears to have better teeth than she did before. Oh, I did not notice that because her teeth are still terrible. I thought they looked slightly better here. <laughs> okay. She had them sharpened or something. <laughs> well, then her bodyguard dude grabs Quark and says, help Grilka and you live. Fail and I will kill you myself. Very Klingon. Oh, yeah. This was the scene where Quark says, war, what's it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we already are in a quirky mood here yes. in the first scene. I was rolling my eyes at that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you think that's a typical thing for a Klingon to say? You know, he threatened Quark's life. You know, maybe that's the equivalent of saying, I'm very concerned about Grilka. Can you please do a good job? Yes. I think that was just normal conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're an actual Klingon and somebody says that to you, it's like, yeah, 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 I'll yeah. do a good job. I get it. Yeah. It's like, oh, please help. Thank you very much. Now, as Worf and Dax head to Ops, Dax recounts the story of the House of Grilka episode, which started with Quark taking credit for killing Grilka's husband and led to Grilka kidnapping Quark and tricking him into (laughs) marriage because as a woman, she wasn't allowed to lead her own house. I'll never understand the joy these writers have of writing a show set in the future, but somehow setting everything back to the standards of the 1800s. They crave for the good old days. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, Worf understands this was a marriage of convenience, so now he gets what she was doing with Quark. Dax says, Worf seems to have a bad case of parmak, the Klingon word for love, but more aggressive. This gets Cisco all excited because he loves love, but <laughs> he's in and out of the scene really quickly, and I don't think we see him again. Walk in, walk off. Yep. Now in the infirmary, Julian is giving Miles something to help with Kira's pregnancy sneezing. And Julian asks if he's still fighting with Kira, but he claims they're not fighting, which of course is ridiculous. And then there's a whole stupid story here about him helping Kira out of the bathtub and Julian asking if he looked, and it's very juvenile. Yeah, that's why I thought, was this written by a 14-year-old? Maybe. Then we go to Quark's and Worf decides to put on a show for Grilka. He whispers at Morn that he'll apologize for this later before tossing (laughs) him aside and shouting that he's in his seat. That was funny. I mean, <laughs> Morn's just sitting at the bar there and minding his own business. Yeah. And the physical acting where Morn seems so stunned by this as he gets thrown <laughs> yeah. off sideways. Oh. It was funny. It was funny. I feel bad for Morn though. And then Worf shouts for blood wine. And then he gets the attention of Grilka's bodyguard. And he looks like he's going to start a fight with him. But the older Klingon guy with Grilka knows who Worf is, calling him son of Moog, and he takes Worf aside for a conversation. I'm still not sure who this guy is. I, I was never sure in the original episode either, and I, I still don't know. He's He looks like he's old enough to be Grilka's dad, but I don't think that's who he is. He's the family retainer. He is Grilka's Alfred. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, anyway, Alfred, I don't know what his name is. He tells <laughs> Worf that he's wasting his time because Grilka cannot mate with him because his house is dishonored and his name is a curse. That's harsh. Yes. And then he tells Worf he doesn't know anything about Klingon women anyway. <laughs> he says to leave Grilka alone. Wow. And so Worf leaves dejected. Then we go to the mess hall on the Defiant and Worf is feeling sorry for himself. Dak says Grilka was probably flattered by his display at the bar, but Worf doubts it. And then in comes Quark to talk to Dax. Grilka invited him to a private dinner and he needs to brush up on Klingon manners and protocol. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and this irritates Worf. Quark wants to know what a Klingon woman expects from a man. Dax says Klingon mating rituals are very involved. Quark needs advice because he thinks she's glorious, which is the same word that Worf used early in the episode. Anyway, then Worf starts giving him advice about what he should do and exactly what he should say. Quark seemed pretty surprised that he actually has to show her respect. Something of an alien concept for Ferengi, I think. (laughs) Yeah, he kind of rolls his eyes. I think mostly as Ferengi don't show much respect for anyone, including other Ferengi. Especially females, though. But really, he does show respect for uh, females, just not Ferengi females, which is very strange. No, he creeps after them. That's different. He doesn't creep after all of them. Well, not the ones that threaten him anyway. Well, that's a good point. Now we go to the O'Brien quarters and Miles is giving Kira a massage of her legs. 
Keiko comes in with Kira's uniforms freshly altered by Garrick, and then Kira and Miles have an awkward conversation about going to Ireland together one day. It was sort of an accidental conversation. Sigh. This is too much closeness for coworkers, as they're now quite uncomfortable. Why not just have a hollow program, give her a massage, and don't start getting physically close in such an inappropriate way? It The whole thing was weird. Yeah. I mean, we've seen, even from early episodes, that the hollow programs can give massages. <laughs> remember the guy killed in the hollow suite? Yes, I do remember that. But it's so strange here that you're supposed to believe that this situation has somehow changed all of them. It's like it's made all of them dumb. And they're not seeing normal things in front of their faces. And that, to me, was the most frustrating part. It's like, really? Yeah. You can't see that this is going to cause some kind of a problem if you, you know, if you don't try to at least maintain some kind of a distance. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Well, this is where I feel it's bad romance novel. Yeah. It seems like a really cheap... I mean, it's crazy as this is written by a good sci-fi author who's written some great shows and written great shows since... Right. Was this like a rejected script that he had lying around and sold them to him cheap? Well, we always... Uh, I got this one. Nobody else wanted it, so... Well, we often forget that they had to do 25, 26 episodes of Trek back in the 90s, and so there's going to be some filler. You know, they're not all going to be gems. This definitely classifies as filler. Right. Now we go to the Defiant, and Worf is listening to and singing along with opera on the Defiant sound system. And he's pouting in his garage apartment like a sad teenager. It sounds a little bit too melodic for a true Klingon opera. I was surprised by that. That's true. Yeah, I agree. When they've played Klingon opera before, it sounded like the instrument test for a heavy metal band. (laughs) Yes, it definitely didn't sound like a song. Yeah. Well, Quark interrupts to thank Worf for his advice because Grilka said he had the heart of a Basai master, which Worf says is a poet. Worf thinks this proves that he knows how to court a Klingon woman. And Quark wants to know how to unlock Grilka's heart. And Worf's like, we've got work to do. So the Cyrano de Bergeracness of this episode continues. Yep, I think that's exactly what that is modeled on. Yep. Well, it is what it's modeled on. It's like exactly the same thing. Yes. Now we're in a hollow suite where Dax and Quark are fighting some Klingons with Batleths while Worf watches and advises. <laughs> and Quark is wearing an absolutely ridiculous, like, white fur coat. And Dax is in a long leather, I think it's leather, Klingon outfit, kind of like how Grilka dresses, but maybe a bit more ornate. At least Quark's getting into it. He really seems to be embracing this hollow program. He's trying. Well, and if this wasn't a hollow program, Quark would be dead because the Klingon he's fighting just kind of lets <laughs> yeah. him kill him. He's got the Batleth right over Quark, and then he still manages to lose. And Dax points out how he should actually fight the Klingon. Yes. So this isn't really Quark's thing, no. is it? No. Then Quark mangles some Klingon. I mean, he's trying, but it's not going great. Yeah. Worf tries to get him to put himself into the role of the Emperor Kalos and the Lady Lucara as they battled some warriors and began the greatest romance in Klingon history. Oh. Quirk is like, this whole thing is ridiculous. I'm covered in blood. This is not romantic. <laughs> and he's not sure why they're even bothering doing this. But Dak says it's because later that night they jumped on each other like crazed voles, which... Really? Is crazed rats any more romantic than being all (laughs) covered in blood? I mean, Klingons are so weird. Yes, yes. Uh, Comparing yourself to rodents is one of the most romantic things. Ugh, gosh. And it is pretty funny that Quark is doing this whole complaint piece, and he's like splattered with blood. (laughs) Yes, it is ridiculous. Well, now Odo and Kira are having their security briefing, and Odo is complaining about Miles not getting some work done, and Kira defends him. Odo accuses her of growing fond of the chief. Uh, Odo seems a little antagonistic about this at first, but then he's just kind of mocking her. And this scene, too, was silly, like maybe the way some high schoolers would act. Where did this come from? Uh, it, yeah. This is like season one Odo. Yeah. And it's so out of place. And especially the way he's complaining about Miles. Shouldn't he be complaining about the Federation and the list of priorities and what's getting high and low priority and that kind of thing, rather than just banging on Miles in a really immature way? In this setting. Yeah. Worthy of sort of petty office politics. Well, this is almost... Look, if you... Did anybody... Did the the writer actually review any previous episodes? (laughs) I mean, seriously. They also, you know, how they don't know how to really write for 
relationships. They also don't really know how to write about the workplace because you'd be having some kind of a staff meeting where you'd be talking about priorities, but they don't really know how to write for that either. Is this how the writing room works? Is this how their (laughs) development environment works? They're trying to stab each other in the back and blame other people for the mistakes and problems. (laughs) Probably is. It probably is. Yeah. I think a lot of writers rooms are pretty toxic. Yeah. Especially when gender politics are involved. Well, you read about people getting fired from them for being abusive. Yes, and you're like, oh, exactly, okay. yeah. Well, probably when this was written, it was considered, well, that's just normal. Things are like that mm. here. You just have to toughen up. So I'll finish with a very grumpy, very out of place Odo. Really, watch the show before you write episodes. <laughs> Am I being too negative? A little bit. It's okay. It, it, this episode <laughs> is not good. <laughs> It's not good. Oh, man. Now we go to Quark's and the Klingon bodyguard is very unhappy about Grilka hanging out with Quark. The older guy tells him, who did we call him? Alfred. Alfred tells him (laughs) to stay in his lane. And then Quark and Grilka appear wearing the costumes from the Kalos thing. And Grilka says, you're an interesting man. And Quark says, I always thought so. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That was the best line of the episode. I really laughed when he said that. Quark at least has confidence. Right. She asks why he's going through all of this romantic stuff for her. He says he has a talent for identifying things of great value, and she's worth more than all the latinum in the quadrant. And then they toast each other, but Grilka's bodyguard can't take it anymore and knocks over the table, (laughs) throwing Quark to the floor. He calls Quark a liar and says he has no honor. And he says, tomorrow you will kill me or I will kill you. And Grilka just kind of sighs and the dude stomps off. She must see this all the time. <laughs> ah, Klingons. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, the guys are at it again, Alfred. Yeah. Yeah, she's thinking, Alfred, can you find me one of these guys who doesn't kill everybody I try to go out with? <laughs> now in the O'Brien quarters, Keiko and Miles are sitting on the sofa when Kira comes in. Kira and Miles are already acting uncomfortable. When Kira says she's going to spend a couple of days on Bejor at a friend's house in a remote location to relax. Keiko says she can't go alone and insists that Miles goes with her. And now we've brought Keiko into the stupidity. There's no way she's that dumb. I don't understand why they write her to be that dumb. But (laughs) at the same time, it seems silly to think of anywhere as remote when you have transporter technology. Because clearly she could just beam somewhere if she gets into trouble or she goes into labor. Right. We can beam people from the planet to, to the a ship. orbiting spaceship. Exactly. And you're going somewhere remote. No, there isn't anywhere anywhere. There's anymore. nowhere remote. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. Well, Quark, Dax, and Worf are talking in the mess hall of Worf's garage apartment again. The last time a Klingon was going to kill Quark. <laughs> He's living in the van. <laughs> He's living in his van, I'm telling you. <laughs> the last time a Klingon was going to kill Quark, Gowron stepped in to stop it. That was in the house of Quark. But yep. that isn't going to work this time. So Quark's choices are to not show up and lose Grilka or show up and get killed. And he's really not excited about either option. And then Dax says she has an idea. Now we go to Quark and Dax fighting with Batleths. And the plan is for Worf to do the fighting with some kind of device around his neck, controlling Quark like a puppet. Worf points out that Quark is out of shape, but Quark doesn't like to exercise. Yeah, I think we could have guessed that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Quark heads off to bed to rest after they try this out a few times, and Worf is lamenting doing all of this work for Quark. Dax asks what he sees in Grilka anyway. Worf says it's everything about her, the way she carries herself, the proud tilt of her head, the way her face betrays none of her true feelings. He talks about her like she's this perfect specimen. Well, I think that's actually part of the thing of he kind of puts Klingon women on a pedestal. Apparently so. Probably because he doesn't get to spend a lot of time with them. And when he does see them, he finds them very attractive and unattainable. Yeah. Well, Dax is like, what are you going to do with someone like that anyway? Put her up on a pedestal like a statue and clean her once a week? (laughs) (laughs) Hose it down. (laughs) (laughs) She says he should be looking for someone a little more entertaining, a little more fun, and maybe a little more attainable. This conversation completely confuses Worf, especially when Dax stomps out. And, you know, we're doing the juvenile writing here, too. Yeah. Again, the high school episode. Yeah. You'd think somebody like Dax, who's 300 Mm -hmm. odd years old, has gone through multiple relationships, experienced the breadth of humanity or trility, (laughs) 
would just come out straight forward to yes. say Wolf and say, you're kind of a good looking dude. She would be very forthcoming. In fact, we've seen that from her here and there in the past, but they're terrible at writing her. They don't understand her at all. They, I'm pretty confident that the people who do write for her put a bunch of bad traits in her of girlfriends who dumped them in the past or wives. Yeah. And they're just very confused about her. Because you're right. She's a very mature person, even though she's in the body of a 20-year-old or however old she is during this uh, season. Yeah. But she's been around. She would just tell Worf what she wanted and expected. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, she fell in love with a guy she was going to go and spend 70 years with in a non-corporeal state yes. in less than an episode. Yeah, she had no trouble telling that guy anything. So yeah, it's, it's so Like weak. I said- Maybe the writers could have actually watched an episode or two before oh, this. Oh, my goodness. I will admit, I, I do feel kind of bad about banging on the writing because this writer has actually written some pretty good stuff. Yeah, but this episode is not good. And the first two episodes of this season were so good. And then we all of a sudden we fell into filler. This seems really early for filler. It reminds me of the story of one of the old comic book writers I listened to from the UK. And he told me about how they loved annuals that they would produce every year right? because they would like use all the rejected stuff no. <laughs> and get paid for it. Yeah. All my bad ideas. I still get paid. For yeah. That. So the next day, Quark turns up for the battle wearing a full Klingon outfit. I'm surprised <laughs> they came in his size. Maybe he got it in the kid's store. Garrick's very resourceful <laughs> when this was in the kid's. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's good. Although remember, Garrick is pretty resourceful. That's true. Quark says he's there to prove his honor and win the favor of Lady Grilka. So the fight starts with Worf controlling Quark's movements from another room. Although I still don't see how this would work because he wouldn't have the strength of Worf even if he could move right. the same way. So I'm just not sure it makes much sense. But Yeah, you totally lack the body mass. <laughs> yeah, it's not the point. At some point, of course, Worf accidentally slices off half the device that he's using to control Quark and everything just goes wrong. Yeah, you shouldn't be showboating. Yeah, exactly. Quark shouts, wait, because he's going to get killed. And then he says he claims the right of proclamation, <laughs> which stops everyone in their tracks. He says, it's a Ferengi custom. So Grilka says, he's shown respect for our traditions, so we'll respect his. And then Quark says he has to make a speech, which the Klingons don't appear very excited about. And meanwhile, Dax is frantically trying to repair the device that Worf damaged. I was quite impressed with Quark because this actually ties into the whole high school thing because he manages to make up on the spot some real high school level love poetry. <laughs> he does. He starts into a nonsensical speech and they all just sort of glare at him. Yeah. And then when he feels the device start working again as the bat lift lifts back up and he says, well, I guess that's enough talking. He may have the heart of a poet, but he definitely doesn't have the skill of uh, one. No, or of a warrior or of anything else. Well, the battle is back on, and Dax tells Worf not to show off and to just get it over with. He quickly does, <laughs> knocking the Klingon down. Quark is ready to kill, but Worf instead has him pick up the other guy's batleth and present it to Grilka. She tells the bodyguard that she returns his honor and discharges him from her house. And then the Klingon dudes leave them alone, and Grilka kind of jumps on Quark. And they fall to the ground when Dax turns off the hollow controlling thing from the other room. I imagine that Worf was hoping that she would leave it on for the rest of that, but she didn't. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Worf wonders what Grilka sees in that parasite, meaning Quark. Dex says, who knows, but at least they're on the same wavelength, which I agree with. For a change, these are two consenting adults who actually seem to have similar things that they're going for here. So this seems like a good match. She does seem to have kind of a strange attraction to Quark. Yeah, I imagine it started in the house of Quark, and yeah. maybe in his absence, the heart grew fonder. I don't know. But she was impressed with the things he was trying to do. She was impressed that he was trying yeah. to romance her. He wasn't always acting like a Ferengi. So I think that just, it worked for her. Interesting point. It seemed respectful. Yeah. Which is crazy for Quark. <laughs> right. But, Yeah. Dax says at least Quark sees an opportunity when it's standing right in front of him, and Worf is like, he'd have to be blind not to see it. And then Dax asks for a batleth, and they start to fight and shout Klingon at each other. Eventually, Dax knocks him down and jumps on top of him, and they appear to start strangling each other, and that's where I stop taking notes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm just going to keep going. 
I'm quite impressed, though, that the <laughs> yeah. writer or director or producer, whoever, was able to get in their particular sexual fetish of strangling. Uh-huh. A couple of times. Yeah, into a mainstream show on TV. That, that was quite an impressive move. Maybe that was the whole point. We always wonder where the story came from. Maybe that was the point. The guy was like <laughs> determined to get that into a story somehow, and he did it. Oh, man. Hey, I'm not going to kink shame anyone. Yeah, do it. Do what you got to. Now on a runabout, Kira and Miles are ready for their private trip. And Miles asks where they're going, and Kira describes an extremely romantic locale, a 200-year-old house in a forest with fireplaces and balconies and beautiful views. Miles says, nope, that's it. I'm not going. They both agree this is a terrible idea. So she says she's going to go visit Shakar instead. And then they have like another awkward moment together. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, oh my God. Okay, let's just move on from the scene. At least she does tell him to get out at the end of the scene. And that was kind of cute. Well. I think part of this is somebody involved in the production. They're writing about basically how their first marriage ended when they slept with a babysitter. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but that probably is the case. Oh, man. It makes it even worse. I don't get She's got a boyfriend. He's married. Mm -hmm. Has children. <sighs> it's dumb. Uh, it's, it's dumb. In s my summary of that is that scene was weird. <laughs> I thought out of place. It was yeah. like, really? The only part that was good was when she said, get out. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> well, I liked it when she said she was going to go and see Shakar. It's like, you haven't seen Shakar in how, how long? Yeah. Why didn't you invite Shakar to go to the house with you out in the forest? Right. Anyway. Well, now in the infirmary, Quark has a compound fracture of the right radius, two fractured ribs, torn ligaments, strained tendons, numerous contusions, bruises, and scratches. Bashir asks what he's been doing. And when he and Grilka start laughing, he's like, Never mind, I don't need to know. And then in comes Dax and Worf, also beat up and disheveled. And Bashir asks, what happened to you? But then he quickly says, nope, never mind, I don't need to know that either. <laughs> he says, I'm going to stop asking that question, which I thought was cute. This is also impressive because this is the second time the writer, director, or producer, or whatever, have managed to get their particular kink yep. into the show. Yeah, violent sex. They yeah. like it rough. So they've got two of their favorite things in. Mm. Once Dax and Worf are alone, Worf says, you do realize that according to Klingon tradition, we have to get married. And Dax says, well, we'll just take this one day at a time and see what happens. Worf says he doesn't like the uncertainty of that, but she's like, well, at least you stopped thinking about Grilka. And then Worf does a weird laugh, like the alien in Resident Alien. And that's how the <laughs> show ends. <laughs> it was so strange. He's like, oh, uh, oh, yes. oh, oh. like what is happening? I... Well, we got to the end of that pretty quickly. So <laughs> do you have over analysis? Yes, I do. I also have my alternative name for the show. Okay. I'm calling this episode the high school episode two. <laughs> I'll call it Teen Wolf. <laughs> oh, Teen Wolf. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I called it that. <laughs> nice. Okay. So I think we might need to deal with the elephant in the room here. Uh-oh. Wolf who is very honorable, was behaving in a very dishonorable way and was basically deceiving Grilka yes. about Quark and mm -hmm. who he was. However, I will perhaps concede that Worf was doing this to save Quark's life. He didn't really do anything I thought that was dishonorable in terms of Telling somebody about what your culture's romance rituals are isn't necessarily dishonorable. And I guess I could lean to saving Quark's life because he, Worf, liked Grilka and for whatever reason was like, yeah, she likes him. Maybe they should have a chance helping him out. This is the guy who didn't want to lie to the Jem Hadar. Yeah. So I highly doubt he's not going gonna... right. to. I don't know. I know it's a really tough one. It's like, yeah. I, can't, I can't decide whether this is dishonorable behavior or whether he is kind of doing the honorable thing because to an extent, he did kind of get Quark into this situation. If he hadn't helped Quark and just said, oh, you know, treat her like you would any Ferengi woman and then visit Quark when he's got all his teeth knocked out. And maybe we're also supposed to believe that he was doing it because Dax told him to. Oh, okay. I could see that. I think in the beginning when he was helping Quark out, you could look at it like he was just trying to prove that he really did know how to 
impress a Klingon woman because that stung yeah. when the guy said that. Oh, to him. yeah, yeah. And yeah. so he was sort of proving a point. And then the next part of it where he was controlling Quark's body so he didn't get killed. Yeah, that's kind of a nice thing to do because you got him into that situation, but also it was Dax's idea. That's true. But I get your point. Dax would get you into trouble. She is pretty mischievous. Definitely. And this is the high school episode, so you're going to follow your high school friends into trouble a lot. All of us did. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Well, yeah, Dax is definitely the one who's smoking. No doubt. The second thing is, and this is really my final point, the Klingons really need to invest in some kind of Klingon level accounting services. (laughs) Yes. I'm pretty sure Klingon accounting consists of go to the treasure room, look how much is in it. There we go. That's our finances. Yeah. In the same way, a lot of the Ferengi economics make no sense. And we've talked about it many times. The Klingons don't really make a lot of sense either in economics if they're not supposed to pay any attention to it, but yet somehow they have to have it. That doesn't make sense. Somebody would still have to look after it. And it causes concerns when they're spending a lot of money and resources on a war. Exactly. Yeah. So it would seem like you've got the bodyguard, you've got Alfred, you'd probably have somebody to look after your books. Maybe it's not a Klingon. It it certainly wouldn't be a Ferengi. Oh. But maybe it's another alien race that you would bring in to help with that kind of stuff. And that's just another version of the help that you hire. Right, yeah. right. You can't not pay attention to it. It does seem to be a Klingon-y thing. Yeah. Once again, Star Trek economics, a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much all I have for overanalysis. It wasn't a wow. very deep episode. <laughs> that's your shortest overanalysis section ever. Okay, over to you. Well, I only had two things. And one of them was, yeah. did we ever learn about the books? Uh, did Quark ever look at them? We never came back to that part of the story. Like, are her books okay? I don't know. He was too busy having violent sex. Oh my gosh, I guess so. And then my other point was, how would that Klingon bodyguard dude not just come back and kill Quark for humiliating him in front of Grilka and the other guy? That's just sort of the behavior we're used to from Klingons. I wonder if this guy was truly honorable. Let's say he bought into the whole thing, which it appears to be. I would imagine there's probably some rules that if the head of the house that you're defending, Grilka, gives you your sword back and says your honor is restored, you're not allowed to take any action against the guy who defeated you. Well, yeah, I'm saying he would maybe go against those rules and still come back and do it. I think we've seen that from Klingons in the past. Yeah. But maybe this is a traditional guy. Well, maybe he's as honorable as Worf. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, he's not House of Duras. Right. Maybe that's where he goes to work now, though. (laughs) Hey, Juress is recruiting. (laughs) Low morals, no honor. Yeah, I'm in for this. No experience necessary. Yeah. Bring your own bat left. (laughs) Well, let's go to women in the future. And (laughs) normally when I have a lot to say in these sections, I actually write a lot in my section. And mostly I just have everybody's name listed because it was so annoying. (laughs) Even like if we start with Grilka, she's glorious. You know, they use that word a couple of times. So she's worthy, but she doesn't fight for herself. She's also not able to protect her own finances. I I don't know. They just, they made her nothing, which was disappointing. Yeah. Because in the House of Quark, she actually, she had more of a backbone. She was a little, she protected herself. She was a little bit more interesting. Here, disappointing. Didn't develop her enough. She was yeah. just somehow totally, you know, in love with Quark, which is always going to be hard to believe. And then there's Dax, and we sort of covered it, where it doesn't make any sense that somebody who's 300 plus years old wouldn't just speak up for herself if she saw something yeah. that she was interested in, something that she wanted. That doesn't make any sense, that she's going to be cagey and play games. And that comes from somebody writing something who thinks that women play games. I didn't like that at all. Well, and we've seen Dax with a former wife where she was just straight to the point on that. (laughs) Exactly. There were no games being played there. She was pretty direct. And then all the nonsense with Kira, and we've kind of beat on it already, but it was just so juvenile and so silly that they would all just suddenly become so dumb. was ridiculous. (laughs) And Miles, yeah. And they made Keiko so dumb. It... Just really disappointing. I I don't feel like I need to spend a lot of time explaining it. Anybody who watched this episode probably sees all the same things, but 
All the women were treated badly in this episode. It was very disappointing. Yeah, Miles goes from being really well written to yeah. bad cliche overnight. Yeah, I'm afraid this episode is dumb in a hundred ways. And <laughs> the women in the future did not get treated well. Yeah. So let's just move on to rating, shall we? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? At the end of the day, I'm giving it a neutral because even though it had a lot of bad in it, it was just kind of low energy, low effort. <laughs> and there wasn't any one thing I could point out and just say, that is the worst thing I've ever seen. So I'm going to sit on the fence here and go neutral. But it's just, it's just slightly up. Only because there was a few funny lines in it yeah. and a few funny things. Well, the sad thing is women have been treated worse on this show. This isn't the worst thing that we've seen. Yeah. But what's frustrating is all of the women were treated badly in yeah. this episode. Dax, Kira, Keiko, and even Grilka. So that is disappointing, frustrating. Did I think it was so egregious, so horrible? No, but it's it's a filler episode. And it just seems like every time they try to do filler, they try to be cute and funny. And the cute and funny just ends up as sort of insulting. Yeah. I don't want to give it a thumbs down, but I'm going to just because uh -huh. of the breadth of the of the problems with the women. Yeah. So I'm going to go thumbs down. OK. I wish I didn't have to. I was wondering whether you were going to go thumbs down or neutral. All I had written in my notes under rating was <laughs> black. Oh, isn't that like a Klingon meal? <laughs> no, that's gah. <laughs> Well, that wraps up Season 5, Episode 3. Let's hope we get back on track with Episode 4. Come back next week to find out if that's what happens. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram at rebingeit and YouTube at rebingeit. Check us out on TalkThroughMedia.com. You can leave feedback there for individual episodes. And you can also listen to all the other Star Trek podcasts on our network, including Star Trek Prodigy, a Rebinge It podcast, which is currently on hiatus, but coming back later this year. There's also a Star Trek Picard, Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Lower Decks, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. You get all the Star Trek. All the Trek is there. So please check it out. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it from me.